switch back on like most packing from like the platform in which you use for development, say Java. How many Java devs? I'm a Java dev too, so that's how we do it. So, uh, web platforms like uh, Node.js, JavaScript, Angular, React, mobile devs. Uh, okay. We are family distributed, so we don't have one source for one group of people, so it's family distributed. So, how do you rate the same network so far? So, do you find this a completely different set of technology? Does it instill fear in you? Or do you look at it as a different kind of a platform altogether to start from scratch? Uh, how do you have you taken up so far? Okay, probably I'll give you my set of story. So, uh, three years back, when the cloud platform was initially pushed to the developers, say I was attending one conference at uh, held by Google for a Google company, and they were initially building the Google Cloud Storage uh, and the App Engine as a platform. So they were trying to push platform as a service. Have you ever used App Engine? Have you, have you anyone tried that? Cheers. So when I was three years back and App Engine was just being pushed, so I was really, really fascinated to look at App Engine and uh, moreover I wanted to start my own company three years ago and I had a product idea. And when I initially looked into App Engine, I thought, yes, this is the platform that I want to develop because uh, you don't need an administrator, you just have to host the server, it is going to load balance itself and you're all done, you just have to focus on development. And after that, I came back home and I started to look at App Engine and I wanted to learn about App Engine and I tried to develop an application, a small application using App Engine. And I almost spent about three to four weeks just to put up a sample, touching out different aspects of what the API provides. And then I started to sit back and look at the same concepts. And I started to understand it is just another server, whatever you host. So the threading, they provide a different API to do the threading. To store, either you use their own NoSQL store or their SQL database. So it is just the API which differs, but the concept was always the same. So whatever platform we picked up, the concept was always the same. And if I had to relate, then if I did the same, at the start, when I looked into App Engine, I would have taken only a week's time to understand or at least start developing applications on App Engine. The mental blockage I had when I started was I thought it is something huge, something different, and something out of the way, which I had to go try and learn and explore. So that was actually a bad thing which I decided, and it was a wrong thing with which I started to learn. So my only advice to you guys when you start looking at a safe network, just chill out, sit back, relax. It is nothing, it is the concepts are the same. So you are going to store data, retrieve data, process data, present the data, it's still the same job which we do, just the API is going to differ. And the concepts over here are pretty much the same. You don't have to, uh, you just have to understand a little bit about encryption and when to use encryption, when not to use encryption, it again depends on the kind of application you develop. So focus and try to understand the concepts over here and then it is pretty much simple, it is pretty much the same. So if you are a mobile developer, assume that you are storing it in your local storage, uh, maybe your SQL like, uh, whatever you have. So instead of that, you are going to put it into the same network and get it from there. So it is as simple as it is. So concept wise, we have all covered, so you guys know what your platform is. So we are just going to look into the API and how you do it. So. With me so far, am I fast? Should I slow down a bit? <laughs> so, coming back to safe network. So, I'll try to explain the ecosystem of safe network. So, uh, you, we as app devs, so probably I'll also put myself in the same group. So, we as app devs must understand the ecosystem of safe network first. So if you want to develop an application in Android, so you know like, yeah, you have to download Android Studio, do your stuff, and then probably distribute it in App Engine. So this complete cycle becomes your ecosystem. And you have your own developer account and things like that. Over here, we don't have any of those complications. So only thing which you have to understand is, you 
have an application called launcher. So the launcher is a single application which the user will be downloading from mainstream. So the purpose of launcher is say like you develop an application and I develop an application. So a user X comes and keys in this credential, say his username and password. And he also comes to my application and keys in this username and password. What is the surety that I can cache his username and password and use it for something else? You cannot guarantee that. The test is always there. So what we decided was like, let's have one place where the user is going to log in and register himself while the applications will connect to the launcher, talk to the launcher, get the information. So it is like, to put it even more simpler or realistically, it is just a local server which runs on your own local machine. It is not a hosted server which is residing in a data center, it is just a simple local server which is running and this interfaces with the same network. Okay, so before getting into the details of the state network again, so how many of you are familiar with encryption? Different? Okay. So fine. So we just touched base with the concepts of encryption, okay, and why we use encryption. So I'm not going to go into the details of it. So just to put it on a very high level, just to understand, uh, so can anyone simply tell us why we need encryption? Or where we use encryption in day-to-day, -day, where you can see encryption happening in day-to-day -day tools? So anyone? Your Android phones have an encryption like at least a 5.0 version comes with encryption. So if you enable it, any data is encrypted. So why do you encrypt it? So if you encrypt and store your data, you, anyone else, whoever takes your machine or reads that data won't be able to understand it. It's more like jumbling a sentence into different things and putting it there and probably only you know how to reassemble it. So the concept of reassembling and jumbling it is based on a mathematical key and this key is used to encrypt your data. So, say like if I want to send something to you, I'll probably do a substitution technique, say like A will be replaced by the net letter next to it. So, if I want to say I, it would be like uh, the letter after H and the letter after I. So, it would, I, so it would be sent to you and you will know like you'll have to uh, just substitute it with the letter uh, before that so that you will be able to read it. So, the logic is the key over here. So, when we take about encryption, um, yeah, we can talk about two different encryption types. One is symmetric and asymmetric. So, in symmetric encryption, if I want to talk to you, I'll have to share the key with you. Only then you'll be able to understand it. Say I lock the house and there are there is one two keys. I'll have to share the same key with you. Only then you'll be able to open the lock. So, symmetric encryption is as same as that. So if I want to send the data to you, I should be sharing the key with you. And anyone with the key can decrypt it. And asymmetric encryption, asymmetric encryption works slightly different. You don't have one key, you have a keypad, a public and a private key. So your HTTPS, what you see on the browser, is asymmetric. Uh, but that is again a PKI infrastructure which we don't have to bother about it right now. So if I want to share a data using asymmetric encryption, then I'll be encrypting the data with my private key and giving you my public key. So there are two keys as I said, one is your private key and the public key. The public key is free to be shared and private key is something which I keep to myself. So if I want to write to you, I'll write using my private key and give my uh, public key to you. So when you receive the data, you can decrypt it with the public key and read it. And likewise, if, I, if you want to send to me, you can do the same. So you will, I'll have to know your public key and then read the data. So the asymmetric encryption works that way. And then you have one more question. So how will I trust? It is you who is sending to me and vice versa. It is I am sending to you. So we have a concept called signing, which we call the digital signature. So whenever we send the data, we also sign the data and send it. Signing is also similar to asymmetric encryption. You have a signing defense and you do it with that. So these are just the jargons which you have to generally know in terms of like working with these things because uh, said, traditionally the servers do it, the HTTP takes care of the encryption part of it, but same network is serverless and we must know 
when to use what kind of encryption for the data we use and the use cases what we have. So, probably we don't want to start with the launcher. I'll just start playing with the applications initially just to showcase like, what we have in place. So within a minute, 
we can publish our static web pages, websites, no matter, without any cost involved. Cost involved is like whatever content you put, you are supposed to pay. But in a sense, like you didn't have to register with any servers, you're done. It's almost like. But if you don't over here, we are using our own custom browser. It is not Chrome or it is not Firefox. It is our custom browser because uh, any browser you open, there is a certain bit of snooping happening. So whatever you browse, whatever you search is being collected and it has been analyzed behind the, behind the scenes by the giants. So we don't want that to happen to our users. So we are so very paranoid and we want to protect you at the same time. And uh, so we created our own browser just to make sure it is secure enough for you guys to use it. So that is pretty much it. The tools are pretty similar, so if you are a web developer, you can always have the infect element, do whatever debugging you want to do. So the tool set is almost the same. You won't find it any different because it is also still using the Chrome engine. Okay. So what else should we do? I just showed you a desktop application and I just showed you a static web page, how to deploy a static web page. Uh, I'll also show you a dynamic web application uh, in terms like blog, which I just tried to create yesterday. So, uh, WordPress, most of you would be aware of it. So, WordPress is a blogging framework. So, if you want to create a blog for yourself or like a uh, plugin like Discus, Discus is used for comments. So, if you integrate that plugin into your blog, so you can start typing comments. So, what we wanted to showcase was that you can even, static web scales are fine, you just have to serve the content, but if you are a web developer, you need the APIs to be integrated in your DOM. So if you are a web developer, you know like you'll have to call window.document or whatever it is. And we have our own APIs integrated into the browser which would enable you to do application development, uh, web application development. So this one is just a tutorial blog which we uh, showcase how to enable comments. We developed a thin comment plugin. So you include it in your blog and it is going to take care of how you work on comments. So probably I'll just put it. So you have it over there. And it also comes, since I am the administrator of this web page, so it shows me the option to delete the comment, block the user if you want. So you have different options. These are things which you normally find in web, isn't it? So whatever you can do on the clear net, when I say clear net, uh, the normal web application or the normal development standards, whatever you do is have this served as a clear net. And you can do the same on safe net. You have all the privileges and all the APIs to do it on your own without any registration, you are on control of your own application completely. So there is no sign up for that. There is, you are free to do, free to host, free to share. So before we dive into different applications again going forward, so uh, I'll do a registration from first. I'll close the apps. So uh, I just gave you two things. One was the location and the other one was the password. So when David was initially explaining it, he told us that like, your password doesn't leave your system at all. So I'm just going to explain like how it works. So the first one is called the location. So whatever you keep it uh, is where your information related to the user information, say like you grant application to this, uh, you grant permission to this application and everything gets saved over there under your username. 
So that gets encrypted and saved into the network based on that location. And when you log in again, it uses that location to fetch the data from the network and it is encrypted using your password locally on your machine. So your password doesn't leave the system at all. Like whatever I did is within my system, it never uh, went outside the system. So there is no possibility of man in the middle attack or anyone to scoop into your passwords. So this is actually one patent called self encryption and uh, sorry, uh, self authentication. So we we'll start again with the demo application. So this time around it asked me for a public ID. Last time I already created one called Krishna as my public identity. Right now, uh, it, I don't, this is a fresh account, so it doesn't have a public identity, so it is asking me to create one. If I want to, I can create it, I'll just go with it. So I've created my public ID, and now I'll create one uh, service, we call it as a service. So www.mainsafe2017.org, you can create any service, uh, any name for the service you create. I'll again see you the same template. Okay, I'll just go to this one. And that's published. Okay, so what you see on the screen, the same bullet of www.mainsafe.2017. So we just slice a bit into this one. So if you look into the steps, we created the account which we call the self authentication process. So as an app dev, you don't have to bother about it, but I'm just letting you know what happens behind the scenes. So uh, what has happened right now, the APIs whatever we have used so far are related to DNS. DNS means like the domain name services. So you created your public ID, then you created your service, you hosted a set of files, so that when someone goes to the browser and keys in your service name dot your public ID, you are going to fetch the content from the network and serve it to the browser. So the APIs related to this one are DNS, to create a public ID, to create your service, to manage your service. Say like you published today and you want to, uh, I want to create a new service and remap it to blog.mainsafe.2017 or old website.mainsafe.2017. I can always remap it. So to manage your services, to manage your public ID, to create a new public ID, to list your public IDs, you have APIs, uh, which is grouped under, uh, under DNS. And then to host the files, to create the files in the network, we have a set of uh, APIs called the NFS, Network File System. So these two APIs are used by this application to demonstrate how you can store files, how you can store private files, how you can store public files, uh, unencrypted data, and then also create your DNS and manage your services. So this is nothing but your static uh, website content. So uh, it has an HTML, it has a background. So whatever you saw being rendered on the browser, it is just over here. And it is just an, as an application which we developed from scratch. So as an app dev, you just have to think about how to import those APIs, what APIs you use. So I hope like you have a fair idea about the use cases of NFS, the network file system, how to create a file, how to uh, download a file, or how to edit a file. So all those are grouped under NFS. Your managing your public identity, services related to your public identity is grouped under DNS. So let's now talk about how to use these APIs. Okay, so how many of you are familiar with REST paradigm? The REST APIs? REST APIs. Okay. So value of 20 percent of the audience. Okay. Even mobile devs like uh, do you use SDKs? For development, like into App Engine or Cloud Storage, you use a SDKs in general. Okay. So there are two options, isn't it? So you can use your REST APIs on your SDKs, uh, even for Google Cloud development or Azure or Amazon. So we actually expose a REST interface. Uh, so REST interface is nothing but an HTTP endpoint. So to simply explain a little bit about REST, uh, REST means or uh, we take a use case in private state. Say if I want to create a student database, I'll create an endpoint, say, uh, 
my server name, let it be localhost, localhost slash uh, student will be my endpoint, so that I'll be able to fetch that entity as such. So I'll have endpoints like uh, localhost slash student uh, with a verb called get. There are, there are HTTP verbs called get, put, post, update, uh, delete, patch. So get is normally used to get any content from the, net, uh, from the server. And then put is generally used to update the content, post is used to create, and patch is used to update a particular feed, delete is used to delete the content. There are much more works, but these five are predominantly, predominantly used. So if you do a get request to the server, it is going to give you the content. And if you do a post request to the server, it is going to create the content. So similarly, uh, we have endpoints for each and every entity. So if we take the same student example, if I say post to HTTP localhost student, and a JSON, JSON should be familiar with it to most of you. So I just put, create a JSON object and I just send it to the server and it is going to take the JSON object, create the student into the database or whatever is the integ integration platform and then probably uh, save it into the database. And when you do a get, you are going to get it. So, uh, generally probably I'll just try typing it out here, it is not going to work. So if I do a get request like this, uh, anything you put on browser is always a get. So when you do a get request in the sequence, it is generally it would return you a list. And if you want to specifically pick one, then probably you will pass one ID after the endpoint. So if I want to pick a student with ID 1, I will specify the ID to the end. And it would fetch me one result. So if I don't specify an ID, it is going to fetch me a list of results. And then whenever I want to create a new student, I will post the data to the same URL, same endpoint, with the JSON payload. So it is going to create the data. So REST is like pretty simple API standards, which is almost used by all the development, development uh, platforms like App Engine uh, to control the APIs, uh, DigitalOcean to control their droplets, to pay, manage their droplets, uh, Azure, uh, EC2, everyone gives you a REST API. So, and it is pretty simple to uh, work with. So if we drill down a bit into the authorization. So similarly, we have an auth endpoint where you can just make a request. So I, I told you like it is just a local server which runs on a local machine. So we have an auth endpoint. So when you do a auth request with the following DTM data in terms of like your familiar with JSON system. So if you make a similar request in JSON and post it to the server, it is going to prompt it to the user uh, asking for the permission, whether to allow the application or not. Once you approve it, you are going to get the same response back to your application. So the response would be containing a token and the list of permissions the user has granted access for. So this is just a simple uh, example showcased in the API documentation using Node.js. So uh, when you authorize and the user approves it, you get a JSON token, uh, it is actually a JWP token, JSON web token, and uh, for each and every request you make from the application, you should be passing this token uh, along with your request. So we'll get to that. So we go to the NFS part. So NFS is nothing but the network file system where you can create folders, manage your directories, and then create files, manage your files. So we just have two sub headings under NFS. One is about the directory, uh, the directory related APIs that you can create, that you can create, list the directories and things like that. So before moving over here, uh, there are a few things which you don't have to worry about right now because like, we are in a transition phase. Uh, for the app launch, we had a REST API kind of interface where the apps, apps were developed based because, uh, using the REST APIs. Right now, we are moving to a different paradigm where we are supplying the SDKs or the JAR files or the dependencies just specific to the platform. Say like if you are no JS developer, you can just do npm install safe app and you are going to get the, uh, what do you call, the dependency install onto your application. So you just have to call the APIs. If you are a Java developer, you just have to include the JAR and just for the functions as you work with uh, AWS and things like that. So 
we are moving to that paradigm, and so probably I'll just touch base only the relevant fields which is useful in future too. So if it is a private directory, we just specify it as a private directory, so it gets automatically encrypted, <coughs> and the data, whatever you put it into the directory, is always encrypted. And you always pass a directory path that you have to create it. So say if you want to create pictures slash conference, so you uh, you want to create a conference folder within your picture directory, you will have to pass a complete directory path. So it will be like uh, pictures slash conference. And if you want to test it, it should be again still tested. The entire path should be passed. So you have the examples right there. And whenever you make a uh, create request for any uh, authenticated operation, you must always pass the token what you initially fetched after the authorization. So everything is session based. So until the launcher is running, you will be able to access it. And if it is restarted, probably you will have to again reoperate the launcher, get the token, and then start using it. So in the HTTP header, normally you set the authorization header, which is pretty safe for like the basic authorization or like even for OAuth, it is a similar standard process. And you simply pass a JSON body with this private proof and probably pass metadata if you want to save some metadata related to the directory, you can save your own metadata and probably retrieve it whenever you want to. So I'm not putting much into the APIs as such. So if you look at it, if you, I'll definitely pass you the links. So it is as simple as it is. So if you look into the APIs, if you start comparing and learning, you'll be able to understand like what it is. Uh, if you understand the purpose of NFS, if you understand the purpose of DNS, probably you just have to spend some time looking into the APIs and you will start understanding what it is. The, actually, the fun, uh, trickiest part is when we deal with the low level APIs. And this is the most underlying concepts of the network. And these are the basic data types which is supported by the network. And this is very, very much important to know. Uh, because NFS and DNS also use these low level data types on top to emulate things. So if I'm going to explain to you about structured data and immutable data at start, you won't be able to understand it. So NFS and DNS are APIs which use these low level APIs behind the scenes to facilitate and make lives easy for the developers. Okay, and if in case like the entire developer's needs cannot be satisfied just with NFS and DNS, isn't it? So at times you need to figure out your own data types. You'll have to create your own data structures to serve your own needs. For example, I want to serve, I want to save one particular data and retrieve or use my own network topology instead of the NFS. Uh, I don't want to create my own uh, directory structure. I don't want to use main safe directory structure. I want to create something else which is just for my own application. How can I do it? Then probably you'll have to go to the low level APIs and start using them. And uh, moving forward, like we are focusing completely on the low-level APIs and trying to uh, make it as friendly as it is to, for the developers to use because uh, managing the NFS and DNS is just a very thin layer above. And uh, if the developers are comfortable with the low-level APIs, then they are start. We also found the same, like people were, my, uh, what do you call it? People were slowly moving towards using the low-level APIs and they were more e finding it easier to use the low-level APIs and to create their own stuff rather than depending on the NFS and DNS for all the changes, whatever they want to. So it gives them the flexibility and it also reduces the dependency on the team of Painsafe to come up with some new APIs so that they can use it. So we also open up the low-level APIs without any limitation to the creativity of the developer. So if you want to create anything on Painsafe, you are free to use the low-level APIs and do anything on top of it. So, So the data types are pretty important. Uh, so when we talk about the data types, uh, this is something which is not going to change uh, across time. So this is something which we we'll have to put some focus in and try to understand. Uh, say like if you have a SQL storage and a no SQL storage, you know how to store data in SQL storage. So it is a relational database. You have to create a table. You fill up the rows and columns, and you know what type of data to use: integer or blob or character or whatever it is. And if it is a no SQL, then you know you'll have to create a collection, you'll have to put entries, you can scale it accordingly. So ultimately it serves one purpose. So you store it and retrieve it. So 
these low level APIs facilitate only for storage, storing and retrieving these data types. It's just a data type. So if you want to store a structured data, you use the structured data API to store a structured data. <laughs> if you want to create an appendable data, you use the appendable data API to create an appendable data, work with the appendable data. So let's get into what these data types are. So uh, I'll start with the structured data. Okay, so structured data gives you So structured data is generally used to store uh, metadata information, or you can store uh, structured. Okay, I'll put it this way. So structured data, you can write the data as much as uh, whenever you want. So it is open to be rewritten. So if you have a structured data, say like the ID is unread, and you say uh, hello world today, and if you want to update the content, you're free to do it. So the same ID you can fetch from the network, you can say uh, you can rewrite it to hello and save it again to the network. But with immutable data, you won't be able to do it. Immutable data, as the name suggests, it's immutable. Once it is in the network, you won't be able to mutate it. Structured data allows you to mutate the data. So the key difference is primarily structured data allows you to mutate the data. And one other important difference is immutable data has no owners while the structured data has owners. So structured data is owned by the person who is creating it and it can be shared to, shared with anyone else. So then you have another data type called the appetable data. So what appetable data helps us to do is, uh, say if you want to allow others to communicate or collaborate to a data type, in that case we we'll probably pick appetable data. And to appetable data, anyone can write data and you can read from that one. So it is more like a common place where you, have, you allow developers or the applications to put in data and you can read it from there. Okay, so uh, just to be a click on the three data types, one is immutable data where you can put into the network and uh, it is not mutatable, it has no owners. And the second is structured data where you can rewrite the data. And the third is the appendable data where you can use it for collaboration purpose where people can uh, add data to the appendable data. So structured data only you will be able to mutate because you are the owner. Appendable data is a modification of structured data where you can allow people to add data into it. <laughs> Now, uh, we just go for a use case. We take up an application which we use for messaging. tell you like how we created this email application. So it is just a messaging application between uh, two people without any server. You can just send it to anyone. And uh, there is no restriction on how you create an email ID and things like that. You can simply create it. And uh, just picking this one because it showcases or it at least helps me to explain the different data types and how we have used it in this particular application. Uh, we have almost used all the data types whatever I spoke to you right now. So, uh, I'll tell you the key challenges without a server, uh, to develop an application without a central server or even without saving anything local on the machine. So first time when the application boots up, I'm just talking about and, uh, this from an application developer's perspective, forget about safe network. So if I want to develop an application like this, then probably the first question is, okay, whenever the application boots up or starts up, I should know whether the user has already created some data or already has a email ID. So if he has an email ID, then probably 
get the data related to the email ID and listen to the user. So to know that, uh, first I need to know the information about the user. Uh, like I need to fetch the email ID from uh, about the user and then start using it. So the first step when the application boots up is it actually creates a structured data the network. Okay, based on the email ID what the user picks. So it creates a structured data in the network, and whenever the application starts, it would go to the network, pick the structured data, read the data from the structured data, so it would give him the email ID. Uh, basically, like when, when you bootstrap it, so you fetch the structured data and try understanding where your appendable data is. So uh, the appendable data comes in place where like, uh, the application will create structured data and appendable data. So if I want to send a data to you, send a mail to you, I'll fetch your appendable data and then uh, write my data to the appendable data and leave it. So when you log in, you will fetch your appendable data and you will check how many uh, mails are in the appendable data. Say like if there are three people adding to your appendable data, then there will be three mails. So you just have to read from the appendable data and show it to the application. So your appendable data is nothing like a cube where people can put, put data into it and you will be able to read the data. So uh, in this application, you have used structured data, appendable data, and immutable data. So whenever you create a mail, we create uh, immutable data and put, attach it to the appendable data. So uh, this particular example, like we have completely documented the flow of the application, and we have a site for tutorials.safe. So each and every process or each and every step of uh, developing this application what kind of a data type we use, how we create, how we authorize the application, and everything is specified over here. So probably if you uh, are more interested, in you, I hope you are interested. So if you want to drill down into these things and try to understand uh, how you fetch the mail and what, actually we have uh, put the reasoning for using the data types. That's the most important part. So uh, when to use the structured data, when to encrypt the data, when how to encrypt the data, when to use immutable data, Everything is pretty clearly explained over here in this tutorial. So email app is one good tutorial that you can rely on to understand the different concepts of the data types. So, Data ID is uh, a wrapper on top of all these 
uh, data types. So you have structured data, immutable data, and available data. So say like there are use cases where we have to do some storage locally or in terms of your, into the network itself. So how do you generally do a persistence of that object? General terms. Say I have a student object and I have the name, like you have variables, right? So name and age. So I've already set the name to be Krishna, age to be 16, and uh, I have that object. How will you preserve the state of the object? You'll have to serialize the object and store it. So hope you guys are familiar with the concept of serialization. It is nothing but uh, you store the actual data as bytes, and every language gives you a serialization API. So if you can get the bytes again and deserialize it, you get the actual instance of the object itself. So the name and the age or the actual instance of the object was, you will be able to restore it. So data, data ID helps in that purpose. So if you have a structured data, if you call the data ID endpoint and pass the structured data handle, it will give you a byte array which you can save it locally and then pass it back to the data ID API and it will give you a serialized instance of that particular object again. So data ID helps you in serialization and deserialization. So these are basically the endpoints which we had during our alpha launch. So again to reiterate, uh, the NFS and DNS. NFS is again a uh, network file system where you can play with your files and directories. And DNS is going to work with your public ID management, services related to your public ID management. And then the most important things are your data types, where you have the structured data, immutable data, and appendable data, just three, not, there is no hundred different things which you have to master, but just these three. Uh, and you have to understand like uh, what to do with them, uh, what use case they are going to fulfill for you, and what type of encryption you want to use for your own use case. So when you want to use encryption, then probably you go for the cipher ops, create what type of encryption you want to, Call and then just pass it to the API. So conceptually, uh, you are still using the standard REST APIs. Uh, you just have to understand the data types and when to use it. And the concept of serialization is what data ID provides. And uh, the tools are pretty similar. It's again HTTP. And you can use the standard tools like uh, for Android, what do you guys use? Retrofit or Retrofit or your Apache HTTP or so no days, you have many different clients to do with your uh, HTTP request. Uh, so I think that we are pretty much covering what we had uh, for the alpha. So just one more thing for the available data which I missed. Like, you have a feature called filtering, whitelisting or blacklisting. So uh, say I have a blog. Okay, and I want to I want to allow anyone and everyone to comment it. Then I'll just use uh, blacklist filter, and if I want to block someone, I'll get that person's ID and then add it to the blacklist. So he gets blacklisted, and anyone like uh, others can come in. The one who is blacklisted won't be able to comment on it. And if I use a whitelist filter, it is more for private sharing. So if I want to create a group among my friends. Uh, just like your WhatsApp, where you invite a friend. So when you invite a friend, you will just add it to the whitelist and the appendability, anyone can add to the appendability data. So uh, this is pretty much about the filters and you can switch the filters whenever you want. And uh, if you want to know the features of each and every data type, uh, basically uh, the sub points within the data type will actually explain like whatever you can do with work with the appendable data. So you can create an appendable data, save the appendable data, so one other important uh, point over here is uh, whenever you create something, uh, you have to call save. It's more like your transactions in SQL. So whenever you create something, you normally call commit after that. So whenever you want to add, say like if I want to add 10 different items to my appendable data, I'll have keep appending to it and then finally call save. So at that point, it goes and gets saved to the network. You can simply do it for each and every request, but the process will be really slow because each and every time you go to the network, save it and come back. So you have the serialization, deserialization. You can uh, remove a particular data from a particular index. So the basic functionality, whatever you need to work with the data types, you can definitely find to expand this one. 
and uh, probably you have it covered. So last one, just to brief a bit about the immutable data. Yeah. So uh, in the morning you would have heard about uh, deduplication of data. Uh, Nick was trying to explain about the Britney Spears song, like how many times ever you save, it is just going to keep only one copy in the network, like right? eight copies in the network, not more than that, including the redundancy. So the immutable data API works on, based on the faking called self-encryption. So whenever a data is being saved, the data is used as the key for encryption itself. So the data is encrypted using the data itself. It's tricky, isn't it? That's what David does always. Just keep confusing us. So uh, that's how it works. So it actually chunks into pieces and it goes save into the network as smaller chunks. And when you and finally when you call the close of the immutable data reader. So writer and reader are common in all languages. So like you have a file screen reader, file screen writer. So you get a create a writer, uh, you start writing the data, and then finally you close, call close or flush or whatever, and then it gets saved to the network. So when you call close, what you get over here in safe network is a map which represents the data. So uh, if I want to read the data, I have to again supply the map to the uh, reader. So if it is a file reader, you pass the file path as a so where you read the file from. So similarly, when you use an immutable data reader, you will pass the map where you want to read the data from. So it will help you fetch the data from the network. Yeah, so I'm pretty much, I think I've covered almost whatever is needed uh, for the session. So at least in the session, it's like, uh, probably we can take a break for 15 minutes at least and then be back. Because uh, we are, as I told you, we are in a transition uh, from this REST APIs to a different uh, paradigm where we are going to use the SDKs. The concept is still the same. The data types are almost the same. And even, in fact, like, it is even more easier to use because uh, Though I explained you three or four different data types, we have reduced it to two. One is mutable and the other one is immutable. So we have combined structured data and affidable data into one, making your life easier. So a mutable <coughs> data is nothing but an hash map. You can visualize it as an hash map. So probably we can just talk about what is in store uh, in the session to follow. Maybe it's uh, in a shorter session. Uh, if you have any questions right now, I know it is really hard. Yeah. Yes, okay. I will facilitate the questions, please. Um, that Thank you for the time uh, given to me. Uh, I have a few questions here, so, uh, which is very basic, but I am just scared of them, so I just want to know curiously about the uh, technology. <coughs> Person? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Professor E is the person have presented about the same uh, in the URL, same, blah, 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 blog, and the Krishna. I want to ask about that. What is the same? Is it a uh, new protocol that I may say has been uh, infect, infected or what? Initially, <laughs> uh, initially, we use the uh, HTTP protocol or another protocol or the URL. So, what is the uh, same? Is it a protocol or what? Anything else? Uh, okay. Uh, the second lady, we have presented again about the e apps your self uh, email and launcher, set launcher, and other things. I want to ask you about what about the <coughs> interoperability? Interoperability uh, with another platform? Because this, uh, you have presented to us a uh, Windows platform, how about in the, another platform? Like some people use uh, some people using uh, like Linux or Mac OS. What about the interoperability? Because uh, in your it's more like uh, it's more like a desktop application. And then desktop application is uh, some kind uh, very like that. <laughs> and third, about the blog about Krishna is in your example. I, uh, I didn't see about the uh, GLD uh, visit using on Krishna blog, Krishna.com or ID or anything else. What is, uh, where is the GLD? Is it a new technology or what? <laughs> Maybe uh, the project uh, you allow me to 
my complete my last question. <laughs> uh, you said that before from the previous uh, speaker from the main set, uh, you said that we didn't store your uh, credential or the credential. Mesem did not store our credential. So let's say, what if uh, if we lost our key? Oh, sorry, man, I, I forgot my passport and my key. It's something familiar. About that. So, what is the solution? Uh, maybe just like that. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So, uh, four questions, right? So, I'll just combine one of them, which is related to the So, if you ask, like, the CF code is a protocol, no, it isn't. Uh, it is just for the browser, it is just for the same browser. So without even uh, giving safe code, if you just go and type it www.trishna, it is going to work the safe code. Because uh, to get the browser working, you need to install a scheme. So uh, even if you want to work on Chrome adding an extension or even uh, for Firefox adding an extension, you need to register a scheme to work with. So you can create a custom scheme. You just pick safe as a custom scheme. Right? HTTP working. Yes. Oh, okay. So without, so in our same browser, if you go and type www, like whatever you create, yeah. even without www, if you just say Krishna, it will route to state code www.com. Oh, okay. okay, so it is just with the browser, it is not a problem. And about the TLEs, we don't have TLEs. We don't have TLEs. Okay, so whatever you pick, if you want, you can create like krishna.com as a TLE if you want. Oh. But technically, there is no TLE. Oh. It is just one word. Oh. Your copy rate is just one word. Okay, so it gets hashed, so that's how it works. Okay, so uh, two is up. And the other one was about the uh, interoperability. interoperability. So uh, you, can, you guys can actually download these software uh, applications and play with it. So if you go to main save, give up main save and save launcher, and then we are tap for releases. If you click on that, and you can find uh, the alpha release of Monster, and it is actually cross-platform. So you can download for OS X, Windows, and Linux. We actually use Electron for building this one. And uh, uh, for browser, it's again. So it is basically Electron and a weaker, weaker browser.
although we may see data, uh, if I uh, okay, can you get uh, it on three? Uh, for example, I have uh, data
because uh, when I uh, sorry uh, if I long take a time, uh, if my application is good and work, just testing for this network, and I don't know for the price, and my user is so big in the end of this year, you said, and the mindset. Uh, put the high price for the for the network. What's why I don't have uh, money. This is a number maybe that's a lot better my application. This is my personal. So uh, just trying to understand the question. So uh, you are developing an application yes. and uh, your user base is known. Yes. Okay, and uh, the commercial is more than that. Yes. I don't have a uh, Money for you don't have price now, right? Yes. Uh, and you said uh, end of this year, maybe you will. See, uh, right now, if you are planning to develop an application on top of the network, uh, it is just like you are an early bird and you have the application ready and tested in the test network. So it's not a production network. Okay, so it is still in alpha phase. It is not even in beta. Okay, so there is a chance of data loss. Uh, there, there is a chance of being the network being restarted. Okay, so it is not in the same way you are going to start up, start developing a production quality application right now. So you can still work with the APIs, keep it ready, and when the uh, uh, network is live and ready, you'll be able to go to launch it. And the commercials, yeah. the gets as of now are free. Like if you, if you create an application and if I'm just going to connect and view the data, it is free. I don't have to pay anything to the network. If I want to save data to the network, save my own data into the network, only at that point I'm going to pay. And if I, I don't even want to, I have to buy a safe point to do that. I can just share my resources from my system, which is also going to give me money. And I can use the same network resources, the equal portion. Say I share my 50 GB of unused hard disk, I can say 50 GB of data in the network. Yeah, they will put support as a thing. I was just doing just a quick add on. I think it was a slight thing. As a app developer, your cost is zero. You pay zero. As an app developer, your cost is always zero. Oh, yeah. Either way, your users pay for it.
compromise your password completely and uh, anyone can access the data. And if you oh, don't have a change password option, so your wallet cannot go and change it. So uh, you can still log in, probably delete the data, whatever you want, so that no one can take it up. So that's the only option. So uh, if you leak your password, you don't, you are completely compromised. It is more like you're leaking your bioinformatics. And nothing is out of your machine unless and until you go and tell someone. And that is, again, a social engineering kind of an attack, which is no way within the scope of the network is pieced out. Because when you say it doesn't even know your data, not even your password, and everything, that so, uh, what's your favorite word? Yours too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it. Uh, yeah, so I think that's it. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 Kecuali kalau dia melihat kita, kalau lagi lihat pas kita lagi nanti, tapi kalau dia cuma lihat layar pasti tidak dapat. Okey, ya. Jadi berapa persen kira-kira kemungkinan itu bisa terjadi, teman-teman? Mungkin di ramai yang begitu ya, ramai yang ya. Okey. Mungkin harus menjalankan intuisinya, lihat kanan, forward, putting in the password. So there's no compromise on that. There's no compromise on that. The no only thing which we emphasize is about a smart password. Yeah. And we don't have any restriction about a particular key combination. You are free to use anything in space in your password. Okay. okay. And uh, we also validate with a strength meter, which is again used by Dropbox and ZS in the end. So uh, probably that is something which we offer or which we tell our users. But if you compromise it to someone of your friends, then it's always okay. Awesome. Ya, ya memang ya human beings are very forgetful sometimes. Tapi mungkin di mindset ini kita diminta untuk membuat proteksi diri juga dengan mereka simpan juga di tempat lain tu ya passwordnya. Cuma kan enggak tahuan tu passwordnya mindset itu ya. Bisa ya. Jadi simpan di beberapa tempat yang memang cukup aman dan hanya aku yang tahu. Atau mau menambahkan teman tu juga boleh kalau yang punya pengalaman silakan. Mau nanya? Oh, nanya, bentar ya, ini dulu ya, masih ini dulu, bentar. Oke. Terkait dari segi development, bagaimana mindset ini bisa ketika ada sniffing, sniffing, ketika ada respon atau request, pada saat di sniffing, apakah ketahuan atau enggak? Jadi selama dan penggunaan API ini. Right now, we are. So, if you ask me, like, whether Mainchain is just focusing on 
pandemic uh, APIs, uh, major P and sub P are uh, broadly into three parts. One is the printing, and other is other two is completely related to the network. So my P, the printing P, we focus on the APIs and how to uh, increase or how to make the APIs easy to use, and what the features would be needed, and how to work on the indexing and whatever. Uh, is needed for making scalable applications on the network. So these are the segments which we work as a team. And behind uh, the network team, which is very, very hardworking than us, uh, they work on certain aspects like, uh, right now they're working on the data section, which works on the security between groups. And then uh, there are certain things in pipeline, like uh, node aging, uh, validating your nodes, and things like that. And then we have data republished. So even if the network is going down, and if you restart the network, the data should be up and back again. The data shouldn't be lost. So these are the features which is being in development. So whatever you talk about, I talk about API and from my perspective and from my team's perspective. And behind the scenes, the network team is working really hard on all these aspects. So if, if the network is to be taken down, it is something like the Bitcoin completely being brought down. So till date, it doesn't happen. So some, something similar to that, if the same is going to uh, face, then probably if all the walls are coming up alive again, then the network should be up again without any data losses. Okay. Uh, but if you want to do something for a space back mechanism, yes. uh, that is something which is not uh, suggested because uh, the only other option which I can think of is moving some data to a clear end because you don't want to be uh, completely reliant on the same network, then probably you have to uh, push it to a different uh, network. But uh, it again depends on the kind of application what you develop. If it is a completely user-specific application, if I own the data, then the application owner cannot move my data to a different system. That is what the system assures you. Your data is yours. And the application developer or anyone cannot take it over. Okay. Uh, but, uh, a question before me. It's, it's, I think that's a big point. You should create second authentication to ask to retrieve if something happened, so, uh, password key and another else. Case. That's definitely there. That's okay. definitely there. But uh, right now the priority is about the stabilization aspect. So the test nets and things like that. So the test nets like uh, the test nets are like shorter. So a month, uh, every month we release a new test net, and most of the times the data gets lost and we restart the network again. Right now that is how it works. Uh, so right now, the focus is to get the integral parts and the security issues and uh, everything addressed. And then probably, when we are at least 80% close to that, then probably we can think about these things like adding a two-factor authentication or like how to recover your password if it is uh, becoming a hassle. And at that point, then probably we can think of those things and uh, figure out mechanisms to do it. But right now, we are dealing with a lot more complicated aspects of the network. And we just want to focus on that one, and get things done, and then probably add these uh, as a later add-on. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Right. Ya, siapa lagi? Perkenalkan, ada satu, dua, tiga. Oke, okay. Oh, udah, kali udah sering. <laughs> Kasih dulu aja, Oke, okay, silakan. Silakan. Lagi, tanya, ada yang mau tanya? Ntar ya, Mas. Halo, ya. Halo, Mas. Halo, Mas. Halo, Mas. Halo, Mas. Angular 2 came, Angular 1 is obsolete completely. 
you don't have any source. And your tool is completely different from the tool that tools that do everything else. So, uh, but they had to move for a better, uh, they had to move to the better world for sustainability. So similarly, the REST APIs were good enough in terms of entire phone pros and at the same time entire phone cons. So to go, come over the cons, to get into mobile development, to get into to facilitate the internet of things, to be developed on the same network, we had to make a change and uh, the concept is still the same. You have the data types. The launcher is going to uh, be thinner and be into to something called the authenticator. Authenticator is rightly, uh, is also integrated with your browser, so when you download the browser, you get the authenticator and the browser. So, as the name suggests, it's just an authenticator, it's just a simple application which will only deal with the authorization part. Say you, yeah, just the authorization part, okay, it won't have anything else, it's more like your OAuth. Say you, uh, as a developer, you go and uh, create an OAuth token, isn't it? And then you use a OAuth token within your application whenever you want to make a request. So, are you from Java or? No, uh, I'm not JSA program. JSA program? No, not JS. No JS. So, uh, for your, if you want to integrate with any of the things that you will be uh, passing this token in the public, right? For, uh, for deployment or like if you want to make any request uh, to your GitHub. So, you would normally generally uh, register yourself, get a developer API token and then you will be using an API token with your application. So, similarly, when you authorize with the uh, authenticator, you will get a token and you will have to persist in, persist it in your application and then use that to call the SDK. So you have no JS developer, you just have to do npm install, save app, you will get the uh, dependency inside. So it will have an init method or a login method. So to that login method, you just have to pass this token. It will connect to the network for you, for your app as on behalf of that user and then you can start storing data. Uh, so, uh, in the next uh, phase, um, the self monitor is uh, will be moved to test and open the network and the low level API and MS DNS uh, library will be shipped to the uh, set. To the set To the uh, dependency. Yes, API dependency. Okay. And the next, uh, right now, what's the documentation? Uh, yeah. It's uh, all of the rest of the rest of the rest of the Set to eight thousand one hundred port number. Is that right? Yeah, it is two of port number, specific port number. So the launcher starts at a specific port number. It's a fixed port number. So it is running on a local machine, and it, I think it is starting on eighty eighty one. Yes. Yeah. It's 800 or something. So uh, it starts at 800 always. It's a fixed code for the launcher. So uh, uh, basically, like, uh, we, if we open the second launcher, it's also like a dominant reason to be there. Yes. Uh, okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Go get a jam. More questions. <laughs> and <laughs> Sharp is here. Yeah, I'm happy that they could understand so much. Oh, that's right. I'm happy. That's right. Possibly thinking that they got your point, man. No, it's not easy to do the in there, so he promised us. Have I seen you on TV before? I'm on TV. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I told you before that if any of you can get our so very much here, that's only I think we're on TV business. Yeah, it's one TV projecting off a lot of Indian, Indian guys. <laughs> uh, okay. Yes. Um,
And these containers are nothing but key value stores. Key value stores like your hash maps, where you can put your key and the value. So, and if I want to access a particular folder within your application, I will request access and the user can grant access whether to read your container or write to your container based on uh, the user's description and that will lead to the application to get access to your containers and start working with that. So, uh, say like if I want to access the pictures container or the gallery, so me as an app developer will request the authenticator saying that I am the application and I want to access the public container of yours. This will be prompted to the user and when the user says yes, allow this application to access my photos, then the application gets access to your photos. And uh, you don't need the authenticator running anymore, you can close your browser, you can simply start your application. The token will be saved by the application itself locally and it will be used to uh, log into the network, work with the data and if suppose the user decides Okay, probably it's time. Let me just invoke the access. He can come to the authenticator, log himself in, and then see the list of applications, whatever he has granted uh, access for, permission for, revoke the access, and it's done. And from that point, the application won't be able to authorize the network, get the data from the network, work on behalf of the user. So, uh, if you ask me where this API stands right now, uh, we have developed it. We say that we have developed it. You can check into our repository. We have test cases and examples to showcase how this works. So, if you want to authorize, you just have to uh, include this. It is a Node.js version which we initially work. So, you'll have to install the dependency and call safe app or uh, send authorization. It would send the authorization to the launcher. It is as simple as just calling functions. It is not any more rest API. Uh, so, that is one good change which we have brought with. The reason for this is. This is also scalable on mobile and even in Internet of Things. And we have developed it and at the moment we are trying to refine as much as we can so that uh, when we put out the next tutorials, we don't want the developers to do a rework again and again. And last time it was a great learning for us as a uh, team and we have uh, tried to do a fit gap analysis as much as we can. And uh, we think we are in a good shape right now to cater almost for the regular needs of the development. Probably, like, as someone asked me, uh, for developing indexing based scalable applications, probably that is something which we can still build on top of this, which we are planning to work with helper libraries to create and uh, give it out to the developers so that they can start using it on top of these APIs. So, that would be like additional jar files or additional dependencies to include in your program. So, uh, the pace at which things are being done. Uh, I can say like at least for mobile developers you can at least expect Android the initial version of it and start playing around with that the next possible 4 to 5 months because we will have to work on Java uh, API integrated with the libraries and then probably uh, work on the authenticator for Android and then give you the entire ecosystem. It is just not about uh, the library which we will have to give, we will have to create the entire ecosystem on Android because you need the authenticator on Android, you also probably need a miniature uh, browser at least to start with, to play with on Android and then probably the SDK to develop. So, uh, these are the libraries like Python is also on the cards. So, uh, we are moving completely from the REST paradigm to the uh, dependency which we want to ship to the developers so that they are also used to this one much more than probably the REST. I can see like most of you don't use REST but probably the dependency is to be application. So that is something which we want to uh, cater and facilitate. And uh, so that is something from our side. And moreover, uh, we are also looking into uh, improving chatting kind of application, void and things like that. But that is later to the end. And one thing to notice is that we don't have push mechanism in our network yet. So you will have to keep polling. Uh, these are things which we want to prioritize definitely because push is a uh, basic feature. With, uh, at least from a developer's perspective, if you want to speak, I would definitely say push is more important. So we want to get, uh, bring in those things. And uh, if you feel like there are certain more features which you want to add to us, uh, you can always feel free to write to us, reach out to us, either through the forums or anything you can write uh, to me via mail. And uh, streaming is one more. Uh, what do you call it? Streaming between uh, applications is definitely possible right now, but uh, from the network can also support streaming uh, in terms of a directory to be streaming. Uh, 
but that is still on cards, it's not developed. But as far as the APIs are concerned, you can stream data, you can buffer data, even on browsers. Uh, it should be supported by, uh, by default, at least in the same browser. So uh, this is pretty much where we are heading as a front-end team, and this is what we are trying to focus. And we are also trying to compete with you guys in the app space, at least to create basic applications, because just creating the uh, APIs is not going to help you. So we are also trying to develop some tutorials to get you guys kick-started. So in terms of these tutorials, whatever we have is in different places. So you'll have to go to uh, tutorials.safedev.org. And if you want to know about APIs, you'll have to go to api.safedev.org. So we are trying to uh, accumulate everything into one place, give you a nice set of tutorials to follow, and probably explain about the data types with smaller examples, which we are already working on, and uh, try to get you the use cases in where you can use these things and uh, probably a better place to uh, start with and making the app themselves easier. They just have to focus on what has to be done. So in case, if you feel short of uh, notes somewhere, if you want to add value, you can be always depend on you guys for the inputs. Probably we as developers, we might be feeling like this much is enough for you guys to do stuff. But if you feel uh, the information is lacking on any case, uh, you guys as an app dev, feel free to shoot a, shoot a person to us. So that is where we keep improving. The community has been really, really supportive. And I can see like you guys have been very receptive and the question whatever I've received so far has been very good. So I'm completely relying on you guys to start keeping up something, uh, start playing with the APIs, and with the new ones, even play with the older, the launch of these APIs. Give us a feedback. This feedback helps us to improve. So, and if you have any feature, if you find any feature missing, uh, probably write to us. Uh, we have two different forums. One is a developer forum and one is a user forum. So in the developer forum, you can always reach out, post a question, either me or my team or even the community is always ready to help you guys. So uh, feel free, feel free to reach out to us. And you can always find questions posted to me and I'll be the most scrutinized person in the forum. So adding 100 more people to scrutinize me is not a problem at all. Feel free. Feel free to bash me on the forum. So for all the APIs or whatever is missing, uh, I'm just looking forward for all your inputs there. Uh, and again, just to really fit on the key takeaways of Safe Network for app devs, uh, you don't have to worry about monetization. You don't have to worry about how your revenue stream is going to be. Uh, you don't have to worry about how uh, how much you have to pay for your uh, what do you call it, the initial phase at least in the startup for the infrastructure, with the zero infrastructure cost, you can start developing. Uh, you can have a mock network, you don't even have to create a network, you can work with the mock network, test your application completely. When you are confident with them, you can connect to the network, do one level of testing which might cost you even a little safe coins. Or even you can try creating your own local network and try uh, testing your application and then probably release it to the wide. So we have different phases in which we can help you out in terms of getting you full start to the development process. And uh, one thing I just want to recollect and tell you guys that this is nothing new. This is not a completely a different paradigm to start with. This is the same existing concept. Concepts what you use on day to day life. The API is only different, but the concept is still the same. The civilization is the same, encryption is the same, wherever you find it. So this is nothing new. Keep uh, following us with an open mind and you will definitely find it easier to start. Maybe uh, with the new API you are going to find it even more seamless to work with. So I think that is pretty much on my side to add to today. At least uh, you have any specific points to question. Yeah, ada pertanyaan mungkin teman-teman. Satu dua pertanyaan lagi ya kita ujung-ujung silakan. Saya apa saya ingin bertanya mengenai menghapus data. Ketika kita memasukkan data, itu akan dikopi menjadi lapannya. Tapi apakah ketika itu dihapus datanya, apakah juga ikut ke hapus data yang lainnya? Kemudian saya takut di sini misunderstanding, gitu ya. Tadi awal dibilang kalau ini merupakan solusi bagi mobile developer yang membutuhkan API untuk membutuhkan API itu. Jadi ketika kita buat produk. Ketika ada orang yang menggunakannya, maka kita bisa mendapatkan set koin gitu. Tapi eh, apakah 
zero to zero as well. Yes or no? Yes. You will lose your system and it's your turn. That's a pro. Yeah, it's a pro. Okay. Yeah. But it doesn't affect the network, so that is the key point. Okay, it doesn't affect the network. So, we're going to give the chance to the very last question from this young gentleman. Okay, thank you for the opportunity. I have uh, one simple question. The, the table which decides to use the right? The uh, data, the data uh, we on an example, we broke into several pieces, right? So, if we use a mobile model, so the pieces will be set on the mobile storage, is it? No. Oh, no. Or oh, how, how the method range? So, uh, right now, what we're talking about is all the times. So, we Okay, uh, we don't know if we can see you again for Krishna.